Hi, Becky Edwards here, Purpose Driven Mentoring. I want to share with you one of my favorite parables in the New Testament. I taught it in Sunday school today, and I want to share a different take on it. It's the, it's the parable of the new, excuse me, the Good Samaritan. We've all heard it. We all love it, right? But I want to share a different take on this. And this, uh, I want to give credit where credit is due. Part, part of this approach is from the teacher's manual, and part of it is from um, some really fun uh, seminary and institute teachers named Emily Bell Freeman and Dave uh, Butler, who put out a YouTube video about Come Follow Me each week. So here, here is my little takeaway that I want to share with you. Um, first of all, I just want you to know how much I love the story. It's so good. It's, it's interesting if you read it from the perspective of the Samaritan, and then you read it from the perspective of the person who is left half dead, like beaten and and we all have times like that, right? What, what are the words in the in the Bible here that uh, left stripped and among be stolen from, you know, victimized and wounded and half dead? Like we all have times like that, right? So we can read it from that perspective. We can read it from the perspective of of the busy, too busy to stop and help somebody, distracted people. Sometimes we're like that, right? I know I am sometimes. Or sometimes we can read it from uh, the inn. Are, are we taking, well, anyway, I'll, I'll get into the end in a second, but it's cool to read it from different perspectives. Here's the perspective I want to share today. What if this parable were a type or a, a map of the plan of salvation? Hmm, interesting. So we know that we come from heaven down to the earth and it starts out, this, this parable starts out, well, it actually starts out with a question where a lawyer is trying to trap Jesus. Why is it that lawyers in the scriptures are almost always like naughty? My husband's a lawyer and he, we make fun, I, people joke about that in Sunday school all the time. Oh, another lawyer. <laughs> um, but he, but he is saying like, you know, what's, what is, um, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And, and, um, you know, they basically talk about the first two great commandments, right? Love God and love your neighbor. And then he asks the big question, well, who's my neighbor? And that's, that's what leads into this beautiful parable. And when you, the beginning of the parable, Jesus, um, says that a certain man, let's think of that as you and me, the certain man is, can be you and me in this parable, right? He goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So in the terms of the plan of salvation, down from heaven to earth and fell among thieves thieves who stripped them of their raiment wounded departed leaving half dead now thieves can be so many things that are tough in life right they could be our own sins or just dumb decisions that we use our own agency that cause our own suffering they could be other people using their agency that cause us suffering or it could just be life right there's plenty of experiences where just life causes suffering uh, that god just allows that to happen and and perhaps there are things that God actually causes for our growth individually. Um, but I certainly don't believe he causes all of our suffering. I've never said that. But anyway, we have suffering, right? We felt we fall among thieves. Now there are different people who pass by and they look and they're like, huh. Now keep in mind that um, when, in those days, the custom was if you worked in the temple and you did sacrifices and that kind of thing, if you went and helped somebody with who was bleeding, if you touched blood, you had to go through like a cleansing ritual and like this time period of, of um, let's just call it a cleansing time period where you couldn't do your actual work in the temple, right? So I can see, I have compassion on that. Like that's a lot of inconvenience. That's a lot of inconvenience for that person to um, say, yeah, I'll sacrifice all these other commitments so that I can help this person. But think about the urgency. He was half dead. This wasn't just a like, oh, we got a finger, you know, a little, a little paper cut. No, this guy was half dead. So are we, are we too distracted? Are we too involved in our own to-do list, our own commitments that if somebody is really desperate, we can't stop and help because it's too, too inconvenient. I hope that's, I hope that we all ask ourselves that question. Um, and then after these other people are like, no, I don't have time. I don't have time. I can't. It's unclean, you know? Then a Samaritan stopped. Now, in those days, the Samaritans, according to the Jews, they were like less than. They were, they were kind of bigoted towards the Samaritans, honestly, prejudiced about them. 
And and so this, I know it's just a parable, but imagine if it were in real life, the Samaritan knows what it feels like to be considered less than. So when you have a struggle that you feel marginalized, you feel less than, you feel outcast in some way, you feel suffering at a deep level, your heart grows to understand other people's suffering. I know you know what I'm talking about. Everyone has had experiences where, whether it's depression or um, addictions or family members who struggle or whatever it may be, maybe a miscarriage, maybe a job loss, a financial crisis, a health, health crisis, uh, somebody in the church dealing with LGBTQ um, identity, those kinds of things. There's so many things that, that are like, this is tough. This is a tough thing for me. And because we go through a tough thing, our eyes are opened that we see others who suffer in a similar way or who suffer in general. And so the Samaritan saw the man and he stopped. Now I want you to think of the Savior as the Samaritan as I read to you these words and think about how the Savior does these things for you and me. Are you ready? Um, now this certain Samaritan, we're going we're gonna to analogize that to Jesus in our little parable here. He, he journeyed, he came where the man was. Doesn't Jesus meet us where we are? Doesn't he come to whatever level we are when we need him the most? He came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Isn't that a perfect word that describes who Jesus is and what he does? He went to him. He bound up his wounds and pouring in oil and wine. Now think of the symbolism there of the atonement of, of our Savior. Oil. I've been to the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem, just outside the old city wall of Jerusalem. Uh, and oh my goodness, those old olive trees are so gorgeous. And to imagine Jesus just wrestling, feeling all of our pain so that he knew how to succor us and he could save us from them and, and rescue us. So oil being the olive oil, the olive press, all those symbols and wine, the blood, the, uh, the sacrament, his, his suffering for us. He, he went in and, and oil and wine are also cleansing and healing in terms of a physical wound, right? Does the, does the atonement not cleanse and heal us? Um, and set him on his own beast. So he was on a donkey or whatever he was riding. He gets off the donkey, helps the guy, binds up his wounds, puts in the probably expensive oils and wines. And then he says, here, here, let's put you on here. Let's save you. And then he walks, he put, he sacrifices so that he could save this, this man and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then on the morrow when he departed, so notice he stayed all through his darkest hour. Christ does not leave us in our darkest hour. Sometimes we feel like he does. And sometimes that's part of the test. <laughs> Sometimes there's purpose in that pause of us feeling him close, but he loves to stay with us in our darkest hour. Then he took out two pence and gave it to the host and said unto him, take care of him. Whatever you thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so Christ is saying, whatever the cost, I will pay it all. And how, doesn't he do that for us? Whatever the cost, I will pay it all. He paid it all with his life, with his very life. Oh my goodness, I just love this story in the, from this angle. It's, I've never heard it before from that angle and I love it so much. Now I want, to I want to ask you and me to think about how we can use this in our lives. In the, with the in, what if that's the analogy of, of the church, of people who are supposed to be ministering to one another? How are we doing? Are we taking care of one another? Are we being our brother's keeper? Are we noticing when someone's in pain? Or are we saying, eh, nah, that's too, way too inconvenient. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and of course, you know, we have to take care of ourselves and our families. I'm not trying to create an imbalance here. We shouldn't run faster than we have strength. But um, talking about um, when we have gone through suffering, we understand suffering, we see it more. I want to share an analogy I learned at BYU Women's Conference a couple days ago. So I went to a class at a women's conference that was about how to be more loving and inclusive to our brothers and sisters who are LGBTQ. 
and they um, it was given by a 25 year old gay woman who's a graduate student there at BYU and a 31 year old gay man who is the leader, he's a full-time BYU employee, leader of the BYU LGBTQ outreach program. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I was really cool, that was cool to hear. And one of them shared, I think it was the, the woman who shared that being gay is like riding a bike on the streets, at least the streets in Provo, Utah. If you've ever lived in Provo, Utah, it was a little bit crazy drivers. <laughs> I used to live there. <laughs> and um, the girl was watching over your shoulder. Do they see me? Do they see me? Are they aware of me? Are they going to hurt me? Do, what do I, do I need to, ugh, you know, <laughs> do I need to duck to be safe kind of thing? And, and, um, that those who have been bikers, you know, ridden their bikes on the road before they have, they get it, they get it. Or maybe those, I'm going to add, uh, embellish the story. Those who have are close to those who have been bike, who bike on the streets, they get it. They're aware, they're watching. Kind of like the Samaritan was aware of what it feels like to be marginalized. He was watching and he came and rescued and suffered. Um, and Christ knew what it was like to be marginalized and cast out, right? And suffer. And so he suckers us. Um, okay, back to the bike analogy. So then she said, sometimes we find a bike path and it feels very safe because everyone on there, they're biking, nobody's driving. And it feels really, really safe. But you can't stay on the bike path your whole life. You gotta go places, you gotta, you gotta do, you gotta live, right? Um, and then she said, and some, some people on the road, some of the drivers just wish the bikers would just go away and weren't there. And I thought, oh, that's so sad. <laughs> but what really stood out to me is that, that awareness, are we being aware of any group, any person who feels marginalized, anyone who's suffering? Are we aware that something we may say could hurt deeply and create shame and make them feel pushed away and repelled instead of feel invited and included? Are we aware of those who don't fit the Mormon mold? I guess you could say this, this question came up at women's conference with the presidents of the releases, the general presidents of the release Society young women and um, primary were interviewed by Sherry Dew as the keynote of the day. And this, this question was brought up. How can we be more inclusive? to LGBTQ, to single moms, to those who never married, to um, those who can't have children, to those who deal with mental illness, addictions, on and on, right? Uh, special needs, you could go, you, we can may list many, many people who struggle and feel marginalized. And, and some of them, they are sh suffering in silence because no one can see the suffering. I would say mental illness very much, very much fits that. Uh, I struggled with depression for years and I didn't tell almost, I hardly told anybody because by nature it's isolating and shaming. Uh, I talk about it now and I'm, I'm an advocate for let's talk about this, let's get help, let's manage our thinking and emotions, let's change our diets or whatever, you know, drugs, su supplements, whatever we can do. Um, but still, a lot of people who are marginalized and, and are suffering, it's silent, it's silent suffering. I guess you could say like the Samaritan, right? So I wanna share a story of a Samaritan from the same class, this class about being inclusive to LGBTQ brothers and sisters that I just thought was a great example of a Samaritan. And I shared it in my Sunday school lesson today. I didn't plan on it, it just popped in my mind. And the story was um, the gentleman who is 31, he has made a commitment to be celibate. He's keeping his covenants in the LDS Church, the, Latter the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that is a tough decision to be celibate and lonely and alone for the rest of your life. That is not an easy road. And so, so I, one day he wrote himself a lunchbox note. You know, those of us who have close family that we do that for, maybe we do it for our children or, or I do it for my husband, he does it for me. He'll leave a, I'll leave a note on his dashboard of his car. He'll leave one that says, I rinsed your sprouts this morning. <laughs> And I save those, they're so, they're just sweet. Well, not everybody has someone to do that for them, right? And maybe you feel that, maybe that's you. And if, if it is, I just, I give you a big hug. I wish I could give you a lunchbox note. <laughs> anyway, so this gentleman, I don't remember his name. I think it was Jeff. Let's just imagine it's Jeff. And so he wrote himself a lunchbox note. Dear Jeff, I hope you have a great day. You're awesome. Love Jeff, something like that. 
and he put it in his, in his lunchbox and at, at lunchtime he pulls it out, reads it, and he decided to take a little picture of him holding his lunch and his note and put it on social media. And a friend of his saw that and she thought, Jeff has too many people who love and adore him and care about him that he, that he doesn't need to be writing his own lunchbox notes. And so she secretly contacted a whole bunch of his family and friends and said, hey, you guys, will you send Jeff a note for his lunchbox? Just tell him how awesome he is and how much you love and care about him. And guess what? Because of this one Good Samaritan's efforts, Jeff got 200 something lunchbox notes from people who love him to lighten his burden of living alone for the rest of his life. And I love the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan that that, girl, that lady was. That inspires me so much. So my invitation to you and me is to think to yourself, no, I actually have two. Number one is to appreciate the gift of suffering. We all suffer, it's part of life. And to appreciate that one of the gifts that comes from suffering is a bigger heart. Our heart grows for those who struggle, for those who suffer. I know for me, after going through depression, my heart is bigger for anyone who suffers anything. That's what it feels like. But especially things I've been through specifically, like depression or, um, Anyway, when somebody goes through food sensitivities, I'm like, oh, you have to change your diet. My heart is with you. What can I do to help you? You know, like certain things that have been hard for me in the past, I'm like, I get you. Or, you know, being a single mom, while Mike went to, the, to Iraq when my twins were, you know, all my kids were so tiny and my twins were nursing. Those kinds of suffering moments make me uh, aware. It's like I see the bikers. You know what I mean? I see them. I'm careful of them. I'm aware of them. I, 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 want to nur I want to nurture and be nice and kind and careful and help them feel very, very safe. So that's the first thing is to sh invite us to all shift our perspective a little bit about suffering, that there is a gift, a tremendous gift of a bigger heart and more awareness to be that good Samaritan or be more like the savior who has suffered so he knows how to succor, right? And then the second invitation I want to give all of us, including me, is to be kind to those who feel marginalized. And if you feel marginalized, to know that you're not alone. We all are going through something, if not many somethings, right? It's saying who makes us want to feel you are the only one going through it. You're not. I promise you're not. I promise somebody out there understands. And even if you can't find a mortal who does, the Savior does because he's been through it. He's walked that mile in your shoes. So I invite us to be kind. I invite us to be inclusive. I invite us to be welcoming and to know that the best environment to invite people to come to the Savior is pure love. And that's, that's the message I want to leave with you about the Good Samaritan. I love you guys. Have a fantastic day. Bye.